Okay. Uh, come in. Okay, so we've been talking about plasticity. Oops. Um, plasticity. Uh oh. And learning. Sorry, my pen's a little off. Uh oh, um, yeah, you can't see it. My pen's miscalibrated. I better fix that, or my handwriting is going to be really bad. Let's see if I can. Sorry about that. Let me see if I can fix this quickly. Okay, sorry about that. I'm just gonna have to try very hard to write carefully. Okay. So uh, what we're gonna do today is we're gonna finish up. Three post rules. So the pre-post rules are rules in which delta W, the change in weights, delta W equals some function of a pre and presynaptic Synaptic and post activity. Oh, this is really bad, isn't it? Um, Okay, this is going to be um, I'm really sorry. I gotta fix this, otherwise you will not be able to read my handbook. 
So in case you don't know what's going on, my pen is miscalibrated, so it's not showing up where I touch it. There's got to be a way to calibrate it. Okay, what I'm gonna do is use a different device. Otherwise, otherwise you won't be able to read anything. Okay. Oh, well, nothing's working today. Recording in progress. Okay. Okay, very, very sorry about that. I do not know what happened. Um, that we're switching devices. We've been talking about learning and plasticity and learning. And learning. And first, uh, first couple of lectures or last couple of lectures were on plasticity um, and, and Recently, we switched to learning, and the focus was on pre-post rules, so-called pre-post rules. And these rules, the change in weights, delta W, between I and J, remember mm -hmm. I is post, and J is pre, with some function of presynaptic activity and postsynaptic. So if we had um, 
And importantly, there is no error signal. Okay. So these in some sense are unsupervised learning. They're just trying to learn something from data. Um, so what I'm gonna do today is, so today we're gonna finish up. So today, And then um, after that, that's one. And then two, we'll start on supervised learning. But it is an error signal. Now, obviously you can learn a lot more than error signal, but of course um, you have to learn a little bit because in the brain, there really isn't much of an error signal. And we'll talk about um, that in a couple of lectures. Okay, so we were considering basically, you know, um, the first several lectures we talked about, or last couple of lectures we talked about um, neural activity. So we've tried to abstract this into a really simple model where y equals w dot x, equals the sum on i w i x i where i is activity of presynaptic neuron And before that, that was spikes. So we can think of this as, as sort of, you can think of this as firing rates. And then Y is activity of post synaptic neuron. This is obviously a highly simplified model, um, but it illustrates the main point. And um, the other thing we're gonna do is instead of having sort of continuous spiking activity, and this is gonna be the, the sort of the, the scheme for, for, the next, for the rest of for the next two lectures is um, you have basically training examples. You can think of it as training examples So there's basically y mu, actually. There's x mu, y mu pairs. There's, in this case, we have to consider a huge number of pairs, basically, an infinite number. Um, we wanna learn from these examples, okay? And we're gonna use the update rule delta wi is equal to um, eta y xi, okay? So there's a presynaptic term here and a postsynaptic term here, and then a learning rate. And what this means is if we divide a time into trials, uh, delta wi, or, so what this means is wi, at time or trial t plus one equals wi at t plus eta y x i. So this is actually a thing we wrote down last time. And what I wanna do is analyze this. Um, we'll see if something's wrong with it and we'll consider a slightly updated version. So in vector notation, we can write this as delta w equals eta um, y, x, 
where x and delta w are now vectors. Um, and so sort of delta w, so f, um, this is delta w, so we can write w um, at time t, let's say minus w at equals eta, the sum on mu of y mu x mu. And that goes, we can write this eta t, the average value of y x, okay? This is the slow learning rate limit. And what that means is t is much greater than one. So we have a lot of training examples, but a to t is much less than one. And if we, this thing is important because rates don't change very much. And we can approximate this by, um, we can reuse y as uh, w dot x. Really the average is actually over w dot x x. And that is W dot covariance matrix or the un, unzeroed covariance matrix. Okay. Um, okay, so this is remember, uh, even though T is large, we've looked at a lot of training examples. The large number of training examples, T much greater than one, allows us to do you put this average here, and A to T much less than one allows us to replace Y by W dot X. Okay. So what that gives us um, is that W of T, oops, W of T minus W of zero equals A to T um, sigma dot W. Or we can take this, put it underneath, and we get W of T minus w of zero divided by a to t. And we're gonna just write this as, as a derivative. If w doesn't change very much, we can write this as dw d tau equals a sigma dot w, okay? Um, where tau is really, we could think of tau as so tau equals a to t. And remember, because a to t is small, this condition over here, this allows us to write this as a derivative, okay? So now we just have to solve an equation. Um, dw dt, d tau equals sigma dot w. And the way we solve that is we write, um, so sigma is a symmetric matrix. So it's got um, its eigenvalue sigma dot VK equals lambda K VK. Oops, better handwriting. Lambda K VK is a covariance matrix. All the lambda K are greater than equal to zero. Um, and we can and we can expand W in terms of the AK. So W of T tau equals a sum on K of AK of tau BK. Um, and so we can write the sum on K of the AK D tau times BK equals um, sigma dot the sum on k of a k b k equals the sum on k of a k sigma dot v k. And sigma dot v k is just equal to lambda k v k. So this equals the sum on k 
of lambda k, a k, b k. Okay. So now we use the fact that these uh, b k can be chosen to be orthonormal, meaning v l dot v k equals delta l k equals one if k equals l and zero if k is not equal to l. And so what we do is basically we take VL dot this um, and dot that with VL. And that dot product picks out only the K equals L term. And we end up with um, DAL dt equals lambda L AL, which implies that AL of t equals a l of zero e to lambda l t okay so basically the modes with large lambda l so largest lambda l dominates the largest eigenvalue let's say so mode with largest eigenvalue dominates. Okay, remember this is exponential growth. Um, so if lambda L is the largest lambda L's win. Okay. Um, and so what is this? So this actually tells us something very simple. What does this rule do? Um, so if in 2D, if our data X, this is our data, has some distribution, sort of lies in some covariance ellipse. Okay, so this is our data data, the x mu, what, the, what this does is basically the weights start off, initially it's weights out of a random direction, you know, they might start off something like this, but as they grow, eventually they point along the um, direction with the, with the eigenvectors, with the, um, with the largest eigen, eigenvalue, okay? So this is basically, um, so this might be W at, let's say, tau equals zero. And this is W at large tau. Okay. Um, so this is a kind, of, so this rule does something, right? It's driven by the data. And it, it sort of lines up with where the data is changing most rapidly. I mean, it's not the most powerful rule in the world. And in fact, it's, it's sensitive only to covariance. So for instance, the data look, you know, the data some like super cool structure. The data actually look like something like this. Okay. What this, what this would find is, okay, I'm just gonna pick a weight that goes in that direction. So it sort of pick up a dominant mode, but it doesn't pick up anything interesting. So it's got two problems. One, it doesn't pick up anything interesting. And the other problem is that um, this term grows exponentially and eventually wanders off to infinity. And this is, this is a feature we saw of, of, um, of these sort of, of, sort of pre-post rules. We saw this with spike timing dependent plasticity. They tend to be unstable. Um, and a lot of theoretical effort has gone into stabilizing mainly by making up rules. And one of the most famous made up rules is something called OHA's rule. Okay. And what OHA said is, okay, here's what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna change the weight Delta WI. Um, well, right like this. I'm going to write down WI of T plus one equals WI plus of T 
plus eta y x i, but I'm going to normalize this. I'm going to divide it by the square root of the sum on j of w j of t plus eta y x j squared. Okay. And what that does is guarantee that, that the weight norm doesn't change. So if you compute the sum on j, if you use the sum on j of wj, sum on i of wi of t plus one squared, that's a sum on i of wi 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 plus eta y xi. And we square the denominator as well, we get the sum on j of wj, this is evaluated t, plus eta xj squared equals one. So the weight norm is always one. And by the way, I, I, I usually don't write this, but we should keep in mind that xi, that both xi and yi are really shorthand for y at trial t and xi at trial t. Okay, so they're different in every trial. So for small learning rates, um, we can figure out what this means. Okay, so we're gonna take this, we're gonna assume the learning rate is small, and we're gonna evaluate this term here. So this is the sum on j, so this is approximately equal to the sum on j of w j of t squared plus two eta, oops, plus two eta, the sum on j of w j, um, xj and I. Okay. And this, of course, this term remember is equal to one. Um, so this is equal to one plus two eta w dot x. Okay. And the square roots of this term here is approximately equal to one plus eta w dot x. Okay, so our learning rule is actually, we can write this as uh, w, we can write now in the vector notation, but actually uh, w i of, actually we can use vector notation. Easier. So w, of t plus one, approximately equal to, remember approximately equal to um, means small learning rate, w plus eta y x divided by one plus eta w dot x is approximately equal to w plus eta y dot x. Y x one minus eta w dot x um, and that is approximately equal to w which remember is evaluated at t plus eta um I forgot the y here. There's a y here. There's a y here. There's a y here. There's a y here. Y w dot x. This becomes a to y. Um, x 
Oops. Theta y x minus w w dot x. Okay. And this is this is Oha's rule. So this term here, basically, this is our old update rule. And now this is what, what OHA added. And what this does is ensure that weight norm doesn't change, at least first order in eta. Now we want to analyze this, analyze it the same way we did uh, the last one. And the first thing we're going to do is consider the small, um, the limit of, of, of basically uh, the same limit we had here as before. Oops, where is it? So we're going to take a large number of samples. We're going to assume A to T is learning rate times the number of samples is small. Set tau equal to A to T. And when we do that, um, we get a differential equation, which is um, dW dT. is equal to y, or um, remember we replace y by w dot x. That's the first term, that's this term here. And the second term is minus um, w, w dot xx dot w, okay? So this W here corresponds to this W here. W dot X is this W dot X, and this X dot W is this Y. Okay, and remember again, this is covariance. So this is W sigma dot W minus um, W dot sigma dot W times W. So again, I mean, so what did we do? Let's, let's just recap. It wasn't that complicated. We can normalize this and that guarantees the norm of the weight is always one. Um, we took the small eta limit, which means we can throw out the eta squared term here. There would be an eta squared term coming in here. Um, that's just algebra. Um, we take the square roots of one plus two times something, we get one times some, that's something without the two. Um, and then we plug this back in here and one over one plus eta comes out as one over one minus eta here. And after that, it was just basically we collected terms. The eta, again, we throw out the eta squared terms. So there's an eta squared term we ignore. We eta y x is this term and w times eta y w dot x is that term, okay? Very straightforward algebra. Um, and we end up with a nice equation. Um, so, we have dy dw dt equals um, sigma dot w minus a w dot sigma dot w times w. And again, we're going to let w equals a sum on k of a k of t. W is a function of T times VK. And again, we get uh, the sum on K of DAK, D tau, it's a tau, VK equals the sum on K. This term is lambda K, AK as before, minus the sum on K of um, the W term here is just AKVK. So AKVK. And then times W uh, dot sigma dot W. And W dot sigma W has a very simple form. This is a sum on K of AKVK dot sigma dot the sum on L of AL VL equals the sum on KL of AK AL 
uh, VK dot sigma dot VL. And this, um, so this is the sum on KL of AK AL. So sigma dot VL is just lambda L. Oops. times VK dot VL dot lambda L. Remember VK dot VL, that equals one if K equals L and zero if K not, is not equal to L. So this thing down here is equal to the sum on K of AK squared lambda K. Okay. So when we put all that together, what we get here is a sum on K, oops, there's a VK here, of AK VK times lambda K minus the sum on um, L of lambda L AL squared. And again, we dot both sides by VL dot. Actually, we need running out of indices. We'll do VM dot, dot both sides. And again, we use the orthogonal, orthogonal, orthogonality relationship. So VM dot VK is one only if M equals K. We do that, we get um, D A M DT equals AM times lambda m minus the sum on L of lambda L A L squared. Okay. Um, and so this equals zero as tau goes to infinity. Okay. And so what this means is this is zero. So either A M equals zero or lambda M equals a sum on L of lambda L A L squared, okay? So it turns out, so if you look at this condition, um, lambda M equals sum on L of A L squared, if all eigenvalues are different, that can only hold for one eigenvalue, right? The right-hand side is independent of M, left-hand side depends on M, so it can only hold for one eigenvalue. And what we get as a solution is that, um, so A K for some K equals one, and A for L not equal to K equals zero. But you can see that satisfies things. Um, if A K equals one, which is sort of un unit norm condition, then this sum, so under this, under this, um, oops, so that implies that the sum on L of lambda L A L squared equals lambda K. And that lambda K, when we plug in M, M equals K, cancels that lambda there, okay? And it's not hard to show that this is stable, stable, only for the largest eigenvalue. Okay, um, which kind of makes sense. And it's and so what the OHAS rule does is give us um, it's the same picture as we had here. W aligns with the largest eigenvector of this covariance matrix. Okay, the only difference is that now W goes to unit norm. So rather than going to infinity, it goes to unit norm. Okay, and this is some. This is pretty much a generic feature of um, of these models um, of sort of these pre-post models. You need some way of ke of keeping them from going to infinity. And there are a lot of other methods. Oh, Wills is probably the most famous. Um, but there are other things you can do and exactly what the brain does is not cool.
Okay. So that's pretty much it for pre post rules. They're sort of, as we saw here, they can actually do interesting things. And we're going to come back to unsupervised. These are unsupervised learning rules. We're going to come back to different unsupervised learning rules, but they're not really all that powerful. So, you know, if the data here has some really clear structure, and yet um, all we do is pick out the large, largest eigenvalue. Okay. And in fact, it can be very misleading, right? So, so if, for instance, if the data, for instance, have a, has a structure like this, something like this, clearly there are two clusters for the data. Um, these rules will still pick out a weight that goes in that direction. Okay. So this, these OHAS rule and, and the, these pre-post rules will kind of completely miss the important structure. Um, and so, you know, to, to, to understand in an unsupervised way what data means, I mean, in much more sophisticated rules. And there are a lot of those these days, which we may have time to, to get to. Okay, so I'm gonna switch gears now and talk about um, supervised learning. The difference between supervised and unsupervised learning is that um, we have an error signal. We, well, we have a loss. Okay. And the goal is to minimize the loss. Okay, and typically, so we can write very abstractly. So again, we have training examples, X mu, Y mu. But now we have finite number of training examples, P, P equals, sorry. So mu equals one to P. So we have P training examples. And we parameterize them with a network. So y equals some function that depends on a bunch of weights. I'll be explicit that. Uh, and x. And we want to learn weights. Um, we want to learn weights. That minimizes. Uh, loss equals a sum on mu. Um, we can have any distance, but we, let's use mean squared error. It could be any distance. It doesn't, it doesn't always this minus f of w come x mu squared. In general, it can be any, any loss that measures the distance between y mu and f of w at x mu. And we update this by gradient descent. So delta W equals minus eta partial of L with respect to W. Okay. Um, we can think of this as L of W. Um, and so we can under this gradient descent, we L of, oops, L of W minus eta partial of L with respect to W equals first order Taylor expansion, L of W minus the partial of L with respect to W dot thing that here, dot this term, uh, which is eta, so let's put a plus here, minus sign here, partial of L with respect to W. Um, and this is equal to L of W minus eta partial of L with respect to W dot partial of L with respect to W, okay? So this term here is non-negative. Um, it vanishes when the gradient vanishes and we have a minus sign here. So under this learning rule, the loss decreases on every time step. Okay, so it's a super powerful way, way to um, 
decrease the loss. Now taking that derivative may be hard, but if you can take it, um, we can. Um, and so what we're gonna do, this is, this is basically, if we have a deep network, we have a chain rule. Although initially I'm just gonna consider um, linear regression. And there's gonna be a twist to here. We're going to, so basically, so we're going to assume there are so n weights. And the twist is that n is much greater than p. So we're over parameterized. And you can see this in the brain. The brain has, um, so, so first of all, if you ever take a statistics, statistics class, they tell you never to do this. Never have more training examples than, more parameters than training examples. Because um, you can fit anything. And sort of one of the deep mysteries is why this works. Um, so this is something in general one shouldn't do, but it's relevant for the brain. Let's take the human brain. So we have 10 to the 14 synapses. Okay. So in a year, one year is about three times 10 to the seven seconds long. Okay. So if we get one training example per second, so so this would be basically P, so one year. So P, let's say you live to be 100 and you get one training example um, per second, P is three times 10 to the ninth. Training examples examples in 100 years. Okay, so basically uh, n, so n equals 10 to the 14th, p equals three times 10 to the ninth. Um, so there's, so n over p equals 30,000. This is huge. I think I did that right. Uh, 10 to the fourth, yeah, three times 30,000, something like that. It's huge. You have far, far, far more parameters than you do um, training examples. So it's a bit of a bit, so on the surface, it seems crazy. You know, this the brain shouldn't learn anything. It should, it should basically learn everything. And then it give me sort of tell you intuitively why this isn't the worst thing in the world. Um, and I'm gonna give a really simple example of let's say we we're basically um, so this is X, this is Y. And let's say I give you some training examples, and they look kind of like this. Just sort of some noisy training examples. Okay, um, hope you can see the red dots. Let me see there. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13. 13 training examples. And I say, okay, fit that to a 13th degree polynomial. Okay, that's kind of, it seems like a bad idea. Um, and you, and for 13 degree polynomial, you can fit things perfectly. But what you'll find is basically you get these huge fluctuations. You're going through every single data. Oops, I missed a data point. But you get the idea. So 13th degree polynomial. Um, you fit the data perfectly, but you're training. So your general, your training error is zero. So 13 points. So 
So training error is zero. Is zero, right? So if you fit every point perfectly, but your generalization error is horrible, right? If you get a new data point here, so it's a new data point, so you don't fit new data points at all. Okay, so basically you've, this is a really horribly bad idea. But now let's do something kind of different. Instead of using a 13th degree polynomial, we're gonna use a um, 1,000th degree polynomial. Okay, and what, something interesting happens. You fit every point perfectly but you don't have these wild swings. Okay, you go through every point. Um, and in that case, your generalization error is not bad. The generalization error, so now, you know, for most of these points, new points with an X, really you're not doing badly at all, okay? So you still fit every point, but now, um, So you fit, you fit new data points. Okay, so you don't do such a bad job. Okay, now what you should have done is fit a parabola to this. Um, so, so the correct the correct model is a parabola. So y equals a plus bx plus cx squared. Two, let's say it's a two three parameter model. You don't need a lot of data to fit it, but you didn't. You sort of have to know know that already, right? You can't get that from the data. Um, and so the thing is about the parabola is the parabola generalizes. So this generalizes well. But it's not flexible. Generalizes well, you can train a small number of examples, but it's not flexible. Um, the green line is flexible, but the green line actually generalizes horribly, right? So if you actually looked at outside the training regime, this green line is gonna go crazy, okay? So you can fit data points okay um, if they're near at, they're near old data points. But generalization is horrible. bad. Okay. Um, so to summarize, so the 13th degree um, training is there. So the 13th degree polynomial is the worst. It doesn't fit training data at all. It generalizes horribly. The green points, the, you know, that's 1000 degree polynomial, a very flexible model can fit your data as long as you don't leave where your data, you actually had training data. Um, but it's flexible. Right? It can fit anything. It doesn't have to, fit, have to be a parabola. The correct model, the parabola, gives you, generalizes well, but it's not flexible. If your data wasn't a parabola, it would also have bad generalization. Um, and, what we, and so architecture in some sense matters. You can think of the architecture as the degree of the polynomial. In this case, um, architecture you choose affects generalization error. Um, and what presumably happened is over half a million years of evolution, the brain came up with a model that's flexible, but not too flexible. And we'll see exactly what that means and why it allows the brain 
to generalize well from a very small number of examples. Okay, so let's take about a five minute break um, and I'll come back and we'll do something that sounds really easy, um, but it's not, it's linear regression. So after five minutes, I'll come back with a linear regression and that will probably take the last half hour. Thank mm -hmm. you.
Okay, let's start back up. So we'll go back to um, this story. We have a loss um, and some function that maps uh, x's to y's. And the function I'm going to use is linear, this a linear function. Okay. So we're going to consider um, y equals w dot x. This is, of course, the thing we considered in the first half of the lecture, but now our loss is going to be one half the sum on mu of y minus y mu minus w dot x mu squared, squared loss. And our derivative, so our learning rule is going to be w at t plus one. minus w at t, the change in the weight on two trials is going to equal minus eta partial of L with respect to w. And that is equal to eta, the sum on mu of y minus w dot x times x mu. Okay, we're going to be analyzing this rule in the case, again, we have training examples. Um, so our training examples are x mu, y mu, mu equals one to p. And this sum, the sum on, or actually this dot product, w dot x mu, equals a sum on i w of x. Our function, sum on i equals n w i x i. And we're going to have n greater than one, uh, well, greater than p. The principle can be much greater than. Um, Okay, so this is a setup. And n, much, n greater than p is going to be really, really important to all this. Okay. So, first of all, we want to know that, that this makes sense. So, let's actually consider um, what a, a single weight update to make sure that our rule makes sense. The ch change in the weight i, t plus one minus w i of t is equal minus eta the sum on mu of y minus w dot x mu. So this should have been a mu here. Times x, x mu, the, or x, the ith component of x mu. And what this says now makes sense. If w and x mu is too small, Okay, and x mu i is positive. Oops, is it plus sign? If w dot mu is too small, okay, so this term is positive, and x dot mu i is positive, we want to make the weight bigger. Okay, and that's going to make w dot x mu bigger. If, on the other hand, x mu i is negative, uh, we want to make the weight smaller, which will again make w dot x mu bigger. If it's the other way around, w dot x mu is too big, um, this whole term is negative. And again, if x mu i is positive, we want to make the weight positive. And of course, we want to change the weights for which x mu i is largest. If x mu i, for instance, is zero, there's no reason to change the weights because it won't change the loss. So this rule should make a lot of sense. But, and it's, and one thing that, that jumps out about this rule is it, that's relevant. Um, in this regime, n greater than p, is that um, whatever we have, no matter what goes on, right? Um, the change in weight, so I can just write this down. The change in weight is confined to 
to subspace expand by the XB. Training examples. Okay, so this is important. Let's say we had two training examples. Let's say we only had one training examples. Uh, maybe one's too few, but the point is that, that it only, this gradient only points in the direction X mu. So for instance, let's say we had one training example, this is our X space. So this is our weight space. So one training example, X1. So the weight can only change along the X1 direction, okay? So if our initial weight was, let's say our initial weight was, this is W at zero, right? The gradient only has a component around along X1, so the weight can only change in this direction. So it can, it can move, you know, it can go in that direction or that direction, okay? But it's gonna end up somewhere along this line and the final weight is gonna be, I don't know, the final weight's gonna be somewhere. This is W at T equals infinity. You train forever and all you can do is move along that green, green, green line. The perpendicular weight is just not affected by this. Okay, and we can formalize that as, po as possible, uh, formalize that. Um, we can write, let's rewrite our update rule, um, W at T plus one minus W at T equals eta sum on mu of Y minus W a t dot x mu um, times x mu. See, so I have that right on the previous page. Yeah, there should be a w mu here. Okay. Um, Okay, and we can actually now all add all these up. Um, so we can write W at, so T equals infinity after running this thing forever, minus W of T equals eta, the sum on mu times the sum, T equals, let's say zero to infinity of, y mu minus w of t dot x mu times x mu. Okay. And we're gonna call this thing, this is just a number. So first of all, I'll write down this, we'll call this a mu over eta. It's a definition. And notice that Basically, if we're gonna to go to infinity, um, eventually um, we have to, fit, this has to go to zero. And this is typical of over-parameterized uh, networks. They can fit the training set data perfectly. Um, so what this says is that eventually the T goes to infinity. So Y mu equals W at T equals infinity. Um, dot xp. So we fit data perfectly. Okay. Um, so what do we have? Actually, this we want this to be uh, minus t of zero. Oops. 
So I'm going to call this W naught, our starting weight. So W at t equals infinity. I'm, going to, I'm just going to call that W. That's a final weight. Equals W naught plus the sum on mu of A mu X mu. Okay. And this is exactly what I mean when I say um, that the change in weight is confined, combined to this, confined to the subspace spanned by the training examples X mu. Um, in the end, the change in weights is only lives only along the subspace, which is exactly um, this picture, right? The subspace was in the X1, so we can only move along that subspace. So we have a nice geometrical picture. We have some perpendicular space we can't change at all and some subspace that we can. Okay. Um, so what we have to do now is find the AMUs. And for that, we're gonna use the fact that we fit the training data perfectly. So to find the AMUs, we're gonna write Y, Y nu equals W dot X nu equals W naught plus the sum on mu of A mu X mu dot X nu equals W naught plus the sum on mu of X nu dot X mu times A mu. I give this a name, I'm gonna call this K nu mu, just a matrix. Um, so what we have is, I'm gonna write on the next page, um, we have Y nu minus W naught dot X nu equals the sum on mu of K Nu mu, a mu. I hope that's what I have. Yeah. Okay. So a mu is this a matrix equation? A mu equals the sum on nu of k mu nu inverse times y nu minus w naught. Uh, X. Okay. Um, and we can combine that with W um, equals W naught plus the sum on mu of A mu X mu. So when we combine this, we can take the A mu and just stick it in here. What we get is that W naught, do this in red because it's important, W naught, oops. So W is equal to W naught plus um, the sum on mu and nu of K. U new inverse y new minus w not dot x new I'll put here times x mu. Okay. Um and I should put the X me on the other side. So a lot of the algebra in the end, this is gonna make a lot of sense. So Y, so our, our, when we're all said and done, Y equals W dot X. In general, after we fit, equals W naught dot X plus the sum on mu and nu of x 
dot x mu. Um, and I put what k is, it's x mu x mu dot x nu inverse. So we treat that as a matrix times y nu minus w naught So this is an extremely important relationship. So this is linear regression. Regression in the overparameterized regime. Okay, and it tells us something very important. First of all, let's double check that it makes sense. Um, if we put in here, um, so it makes sense. So if X equals X alpha, right? Um, this sum Y equals W naught plus the sum on mu and nu of x alpha dot x mu, x mu dot x nu inverse, put parentheses around here to make it more clear. Dot x nu inverse, I'll do it here as well. Um, times y nu minus w naught at x nu. Um, so this quantity here, let me sum on mu, This is a matrix time it's inverse. This is delta alpha nu. Okay, that's from the sum on mu. And then when we sum on out, when we sum on nu, um, this, if we combine these two, so combine this with the sum on nu. We get y nu, we get y alpha minus w naught dot x alpha. Okay, kind of makes sense, right? This is this this quantity here is a matrix, and when x equals x alpha, just the inverse of that matrix, and that's good because in that case we get um, let's go to green. So this equals w naught dot x alpha plus y alpha minus w naught dot x alpha, okay? Okay, so we fit, so we, as it, so this is just a sanity check. So we fit training example, fit training data, perfectly. Okay, um, as it should. So this is just a sanity check. Okay, but if you look at this, so what? So this, this is this is this is good news. But what's this doing? I'm gonna actually rewrite that on the next page, so we have more room. So y equals w naught. plus um, the sum on mu and nu of x dot x mu, x mu dot x nu inverse 
um, times y nu minus w naught dot x nu. Okay. So as we saw early, we fit training example, or we fit training example perfectly. Which is exactly what you expect in an overparameterized system. And um, for for new data, so we interpolate sort of. Well, we interpolate. or extrapolate. Okay, so the picture is something like this. So here are our data points. So the, the blue ones, oops. So the blue points are gonna be our training examples. So the blue are training examples, training examples. Remember those we fit perfectly. All the stuff in between for the green points, we interpolate. Okay. So this is a function that matches perfectly on the blue points. This is perfectly on the blue points. And it can matches, you know, some degree on the green points. And so interpolation. So fit is good if um, green points are near blue points. And so that can only happen. Um, so, so the main comment here, the key point is that happens if data lies on a subspace that's small compared to P. Okay, we have P data points. And we have n, we have way, seems like we have way too many parameters, that would be bad. But let's take an extreme example. Extreme example is when we have um, our data, so our data, the true data distribution lies on a line. Okay. That's a true data distribution. Remember when we fit our weights, our weights is gonna be, you know, our weights is gonna start off here. Our weights is only gonna change along this line, right? So change in weights are only along this line because we can only change in, in sort of the data direction, right? So the final weight, the final weight is gonna look something like this. The final weight. Um, so if we happen to get a data point, if we got a data point out here, yellow's a bad color, but a data point out here out here. Hmm. 
not be fit well. Okay. And that makes sense because we don't have any training examples for, for the weights perpendicular to, um, to our manifold. However, the data doesn't live out here. All the data lives along the line. All data, including new data, or including unseen data, lives along this line. And so even though we had a huge number of parameters compared to, I mean, we could have a million parameters, a trillion parameters, we have basically infinite number of parameters compared to, you know, some finite training example. I mean, the training, we only need to train on a handful of, handful of, of data points, right? Maybe we only trained on like 10 data points. We fit our weights almost perfectly, um, even though we had a huge number of parameters, okay? So this is really the main point of all this. Um, and we can also see that if we have a new data point, and we can sort of see that as well here, um, let's say we have a new data point. So a new data point. That had X, that X mu equal to zero. In this case, y equals w naught dot x. It just basically uses initial weights. And of course, it's fitting random. It's, it's just, it doesn't know anything, right? Um, and that, that basically corresponds to um, this yellow point here, right? The yellow point here is off the manifold. And for that, you use the initial weights. You use it sort of initial weights in this direction. Um, and so you're just basically a chance. So what we believe is happening, so here's what we believe, or V equals me. Um, what does evolution do for us? So we have, remember, we have a massively over-parameterized brain. So evolution, Figure it out. Um, that data um, lies on a low dimensional manifold. Um, so either a it didn't know which low dimension didn't know which low dimensional manifold which low the manifold. So it gave us a nice flexible brain that could find the low D manifold, couldn't tell us ahead of time, or B, um, it couldn't provide enough initial conditions, it couldn't provide um, information. Set the weights. And it kind of makes sense for things like language and who your friends are, um, who, what, who's going to eat you, who's not, that varies from one generation to the next. So it doesn't make sense to pass that through the manifold, um, through the genetic bottleneck. Um, however, for things like, for most animals actually work pretty much as soon as they're born. I mean, even large mammals like horses are running around in a few days. They don't bump into trees. 
their motor system works, their sensory system works, it gets tuned, it gets better, but it works pretty well out of the box. Um, you should actually Google, Google iguanas, iguanas versus snakes. So these poor iguanas are born in one place and they have to go somewhere else to, um, to where they, they have to go to where they live and between them where they're born and where they live are a bunch of snakes, hundreds of snakes. And they're really, really good at avoiding them. And this is literally 30 seconds after they're born. So in that case, um, evolution did a really good job of setting the weights. In humans, because we learn more complicated things, presumably, in sort of higher primates, it takes a little while for us to um, learn them. But most animals besides humans learn very little. Um, so it's over um, but it managed to pick out data lives on low dimensional manifolds, so that doesn't hurt. And the overparameterization presumably gives you flexibility. Um, it seems to be too overparameterized. We don't quite know why. Um, so that's a bit of a mystery, but, but the main take home message is really, and we're gonna see this in um, other examples. The main take home message is, um, is this one, right? If the data lies in the subspace is small compared to the number of training points, um, over parameterization doesn't hurt. Okay, if the data doesn't line in a small, small subspace, over parameterization really hurts. Okay, so I'm going to end here. I'm going to hang out if you have any questions. And then tomorrow we'll go, we'll talk about, um, we'll go past linear regression. Um, although past linear regression is hard to do anything analytic, although you can do some things. Okay. I'm gonna hang out here for a little while if you have any questions. And I will save this to photos before I forget. Yep, save the photos. Okay, no question, I'm going to end and I'll see you in two days.